thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, so basically, subluxated IOLs are frequently encountered in my clinical practice. The 10-year cumulative rate is estimated to be at around uh, 1%, and in my clinic, it's probably somewhere around 3-4%, but that is because of the referral sources that I have in the community. Um, uh, so um, one thing that was published recently in 2014 in the American Journal of Ophthalmology is actually the indications for IOL exchange. And uh, you alluded to the fact that uh, some patients who are multifocal are unhappy and they are coming in for uh, changes of their IOLs. And what we notice <coughs> uh, versus back in the early 2000 or late 90s, the trend has actually changed that IOL exchanges now uh, for malposition are only 47% and for malfunction is actually 53%. So the majority of IOLs that are being exchanged is actually because of a malfunction of a well-positioned IOL rather than a dislocated IOL. So by malposition, I mean dislocation, decentration, and subluxation. By malfunction, I mean aberrations. Uh, uh, being off target, optic opacification, uveitis, glaucoma, hyphema, or in patients where the lens, especially in the anterior chamber, intraocular lens, uh, pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. So uh, these are the trends of where we are heading with the IOL exchanges. Uh, the malposition, the risk factors are mainly complicated uh, cataract extraction, trauma, myopia, retina, retina surgery, pseudoxfoliation, connective tissue disease, and the parts plane of vitrectomy retina surgery. So this is actually a uh, video to show once you have a dislocated IOL, what are the different ways to do it. This video, uh, the first couple uh, parts of it belong to Dr. Walter Stark, who's my colleague, my mentor, as well as co-author on uh, these studies. Uh, so you could, uh, the most important part is really to liberate the IOL and to bring it up to the anterior chamber. If this is a graphic for the researchers, you can turn the, uh, you know, the other way around if you want to. Um, so you cut the lens and you, get, you can get half of it, but you don't really need to do that. You can do a Pac-Man where you cut only a quarter in it. Another way is to bring it up to the anterior chamber. And it's, very, it's really good to know where your haptics are and just to rotate where your haptics, uh, what the angle of your haptics, so you are not tearing the iris in the process. So here we know that the haptic direction is that way. So we're rotating around, uh, around it in the, to the blunt edge so we do not cause iris trauma. And once it is there, you can either cut it or you can fold it. And you just basically extract it. This is a lens that had a little bit of an itch, that, and the patient are, uh, was having a lot of glare and halos. So you can actually uh, fold also three-piece IOLs. PMMAs are very, you know, are difficult, uh, uh, and those uh, you should just enlarge the wound and bring them out. But uh, some of uh, these acrylic three pieces can be folded easily, and you can even fold it with a summering ring with a dense uh, phimotic capsule. So those are multiple ways of explanting a dislocated or malfunctioning IOL from the eye. Now, once the eye is aphakic, you have a few, ch a few options of how to actually manage an aphakic uh, uh, eye. One option is contact lenses or glasses. Glasses are, if the patient has a good working eye in the, uh, in the other non-traumatic or non-dislocated, uh, glasses are not really an option. So contact lenses or IOL. Now, when you are talking about the IOLs, you have two, cho two major choices. Should you put it in the anterior chamber or should you put it in the posterior chamber? And in the posterior chamber, uh, so the, I the anterior chamber, you have an angle supported or iris enclave uh, IOL. In the posterior chamber, you have iris sutured or scleral. And in the scleral, you can either have it sutured or you can have it glued. So this is sort of at least all of the options that uh, you have in how to treat a, uh, an aphakic eye. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? The ACIOL is the fact that it's very easy to do, and there is no way that it is going to go back. There's no posterior subluxation of the lens. The disadvantages is it can dislocate. It can move to part of the angle one way or the other. It can tilt. It can cause pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. It can rub against the iris causing uveitis, glaucoma, hyphema, and the inflammation can lead to cystoid macular edema or pseudophagic bullous keratopathy and pupillary block. That's why every patient has a PI if you're going to put an ACIOL. For PCIOL, the advantages is 
that's where the lens usually belongs. So it's much more physiologic than an anterior chamber. And the possibility of pseudophagic bullous keratopathy aside from a surgical trauma, so if the surgical trauma is avoided, it's rather small relative to the ACL. The disadvantages is it, it is more likely to dislocate or to tilt. It has a steep learning curve. It can cause uh, cystoid macular edema if, the, if there is especially iris chafing. And uh, vitreous hy uh, hemorrhage or hyphema, especially right in the first week after the surgery itself, uh, there are some of retinal detachment, and there are some reports of suture erosion or degradation in sutured IOLs about 10 to 15 years later, and uh, we can talk about that, why that happens. Interestingly, the IOL exchange trend, so what did we used to do in 1991? You see that most of the secondary IOLs we used to implant were actually AC IOLs, and, and about only a quarter was posterior chamber. Versus in 2014, it actually, the trend has reversed, where we have more than 92% putting it in the posterior chamber and only about 7.5% putting it in the, into the anterior chamber. So this is a report in 2003 that uh, was by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and what they said is ACIOL, iris sutured IOL, and scleral sutured IOLs are safe and effective and just as importantly, there's no significant difference in the outcome in whichever one you do. So really, that leaves you to one thing, and that is it totally depends on what your preference is as a surgeon. So what do you do typically? My uh, favorite technique is actually an iris-fixated IOL, and I'll explain why. Uh, uh, and I'll go over some of the steps and the pros. The iris fixated IOL, you can actually do it through a 3.5 millimeter wound. So you do not have to create a big wound for a PMMA lens, typically, you know, five, five and a half uh, millimeter wound. Uh, so the astigmatism is less than, and the potential for infection is less with a small corneal incision. Uh, number two is that it really um, is. Uh, you're, you don't have to cut the conjunctiva. You do not have to make a scleral tunnel, especially in these traumatic eyes. They are at a higher risk of a glaucoma. So uh, preserving the conjunctiva as much as possible is a great way for your glaucoma surgeon to follow years down the line if this patient needs glaucoma surgery. What I do typically is I do not dilate these patients. I only give them a retrobulbar block, and the retrobulbar block actually dilates the pupil just a little bit. Uh, and I do 3.5 millimeter clear, clear corneal incisions. I, I use this code to just keep things um, uh, together. My favorite lens for these is the MA50BM. It's a 6.5 millimeter optic, and it is non-aspheric. So even if it decenters a little bit, it doesn't matter. There is no aspherical aberration in it. The, um, uh, I use a 10O or 9O proline uh, suture. Uh, usually Lester hook and mechanical, and what I typically use is a modified mechanical suture. So what uh, this, if you actually just Google my name and IOL subluxation, you will find these high definition pictures are available on the internet. So the way I do it is I fold the lens in a mustache technique, and this was taught to me by Dr. Walter Stark. Um, and then you actually, when you're bringing it in, you have the, le uh, the trailing haptic going in first, otherwise it will crimp and it will break. You put it inside the eye in an optic capture technique where the haptics are underneath the iris and the optic is above the iris. And then you open it. When you're opening it, it's a really good idea to have a second instrument underneath the optic just in case if the whole lens wants to open and go behind the iris. That way you, ha you do not need a retina sur uh, surgeon to come and retrieve it. So having a second instrument there holds it in place. And here it is. And once you are done, you actually lift it up a little bit, and you, see, you start seeing your haptic silhouettes right there. And this is what we call the cat eye capture technique. And you pass it through the cornea, under the, uh, through the iris, under the haptic, through the iris again, and back through the cornea. You externalize, uh, you externalize your stitches, and then you tie them, and then basically you push the lens back. So the whole procedure should take about 12 to 15 minutes to do. So it's, it's, and that is another uh, real advantage to this surgery rather than the scleral, uh, the scleral fixated eye walls. So this is actually a, um, this is uh, just to show you a video. So you see that you're holding it Right, well, uh, right, almost just a tie, uh, 10 degrees where the haptic optic junction is, and you hold it in a mustache technique. So, this is the mustache right there. 
So these now the inserting forceps and the trailing haptic goes first so that it doesn't crimp. Now, once you are there, you get your second instrument. You put your second instrument underneath the optic before you start opening. And now we're just retrieving this. I, I think I'll show you uh, through the second one, uh, the whole thing. So you just throw a 311. And you cut it and you internalize the stitch. So this is, you're going to see it from the very beginning. You go through the iris, under the haptic, and you do not need a whole lot. All you need is just a very small piece of the iris. And if, because if you take a big piece, they actually you're going to have a cat eye appearance to the pupil and you're going to distort the pupil. And the other thing is you don't want to go very central. You actually want to go to the mid periphery as well. That way you do not distort the shape of the pupil. And then once you push it back in, the lens is in and the pupil is rather centered. You can actually do this with retina surgery. Uh, this is another one. You can do it in a trauma surgery. Uh, uh, so this is actually a patient that was referred to me by my glaucoma service, uh, uh, who was referred to them because the patient has had a glaucoma surgery. And one of the things is that you see the trab here, but you see an over generous PI right there by the surgeon that operated on this patient. And Another thing that you will soon realize is not only did they eat the iris, but they actually ate the zonules as well. So this patient has zon no zonules practically, all the way from uh, his one o'clock through to his about eight o'clock, or if you want to call it like from eight o'clock to about one o'clock. So there's more than 180 degrees of no zonules in this case. So I start with iris retractors to the iris, and you can see that there are no zonules in all of this region. And I'm going very gentle because I don't want to put any more stress on the zonules that are still there. And I normally do these procedures actually in the retina room just in case there is a, there is a problem. But in this case, I was, um, I was by myself, so I was extra cautious. So you'll see me just taking, the, taking my time to do the capsulotomy, the capsulorexis. And now once I do the capsulorexis, what I do is I actually take my iris retractors and instead of them having on the iris, I actually hold my capsule with my, with my iris retractors. So my iris retractors now are giving me support to the capsule. And then I proceed typically with just a normal cataract surgery. One way that I really like for these traumatic surgery, uh, traumatic cataracts um, uh, where there's significant zonular weakness is I like the pop and chop technique. So where I pop the lens to the anterior chamber, I put viscoelastic underneath it and I bring it to the anterior chamber and I just eat it. That way I have very less uh, uh, minimal uh, stress on the zonules that are already weakened and traumatized. So you see that I'm operating a little bit more anterior. And again, I'm being very cautious and very gentle. Now that I am done, I remove the iris retractors because I don't need them anymore and I need the pupil to actually go down. And this gentleman actually did not need a vitrectomy. And the way you actually preserve yourself and save yourself from a vitrectomy typically is if you go right above here and you put generous amount of viscoat to really protect your, cha uh, your chamber from the vitreous. So you're uh, creating a barrier. And now I put the three-piece IOL. And I intentionally don't want to put the haptics in the bag because I want to suture them. So this is real time. You see that my opening of the capsulotomy is right there. And I don't really, I don't trust my zonules yet. So that's why you see me always supporting it. Now I go in and I pass it through the iris up 
and I basically suture it. And you can see there's, this area is still rather weak. And once I create the support system for the haptic, basically I am home. Now that my IOL is supported, I suture the other side. And then what I do next is you'll see me going and pushing the lens into the bag. So this is actually the lens itself is in the bag. The haptics are in the sulcus and the haptics are sutured to the iris. So we actually looked at our, um, uh, at our uh, outcome, uh, at our surgical outcomes, and what we wanted to do is the eye wall stability, what is the visual acuity, induction of astigmatism, and the safety. And what we did for this specific study, we're looking at other things, but what we really wanted to do is just patients who had dislocated eye walls. So the major uh, patients that we are dealing with in this study is just dislocated eye walls. And what we had is we actually in, included patients who had comorbidities. Uh, uh, we excluded patients who had combined corneal surgery, uh, posterior dislocations all the way, basically in the vitreous, without uh, having you know uh, no zonules at all, just in the vitreous. Secondary implantations for aphakia or at the time of cataract surgery. And uh, we basically followed these patients for about uh, 16 months. And there are 62 eyes at minimum who we followed for a minimum of 30 days. And what you find is in the results, best corrected visual acuity improved in all of the patients. Uh, in uh, the mean best corrected visual acuity improved, and that was statistically significant. The spherical equivalent, we actually ended up having a little bit more myopic shift. And that probably has to do with the fact that iris sutured IOL sits just a little bit more anterior than a bag or in the bag IOL. So if you're going to put an iris sutured IOL, I would aim for about a half of a hyperopia. That way you end up right on target. Induction of astigmatism, again, because of the one point, uh, because of the three millimeter, 3.5 millimeter corneal incision, you see actually, in general, we ended up having less astigmatism than before. But really, this technique from our Pentacam studies does not show any induction of astigmatism. The complications, there are two newly diagnosed cases of glaucoma. Again, a lot of our patients had pseudo exfoliation to start with, so they probably were predisposed to glaucoma. Five cases of cystoid macular edema and one event of anterior uveitis. Hemorrhagic complications, there was hyphema in seven eyes that was a transient with uh, conservative medical management, they resolved. And uh, vitreous hemorrhage in eight eyes, and that also resolved on its own. None of them needed vitrectomy. There was one case of uh, rigmatosinous retinal detachment. There was one case of choroidal detachment, and there were no cases of endothelmitis. So iris sutured fixation of IOLs in pseudophagic eyes with subluxated IOLs is an efficacious treatment method. The safety profile is actually rather acceptable. Um, how much time do I have? Because I can go to scleral sutured IOL, or I can stop if we are running late. I'll we're stop. Late. I'll take, I'll take your running questions. Late. We're running late. Does anybody have questions? You have a question about glaucoma, and you'll have a question about something. So, <laughs> go ahead. As far as dislocation goes, that's a beautiful question. <clears throat> Uh, and that we are actually actively looking at that right now, uh, and. Um, it's really hard to answer your question because we tried to control for that. And the reason I'm saying that we tried to control for that is typically the practice of most ophthalmologists is the fact that they will put a three-piece IOL in a complex or complicated surgery and they would put a single piece in a routine surgery. So is the single piece, you know, if the three piece dislocates more, is it because it's a three piece or is it because it's a pseudo exfoliation patient who has zonular weakness yeah, or a high myo? So to really answer that question, it's almost impossible to answer it except in a patient who is identical, who had one piece in one eye and three piece in the other eye. But we are really trying to come up with the creative ideas. Now, if you actually look at this series, the majority of the patients are single piece, but that is not because single pieces dislocate more than three pieces. That is because if you ask the company, the most of our preference is a single piece because it's easier to implant. 
So by nature, the predominant IOL that is implanted in the eye is a single piece. And thus, by proportion, single pieces should dislocate more. But absolutely, single pieces versus three pieces, we don't know the answer to that question. That's a beautiful question. But to answer your question the other way also is if somebody has pseudo exfoliation, if somebody is on the flow max, if somebody has poor dilation or diabetes, then those people automatically I put three piece okay. for multiple reasons. Not only whether it dislocates or not, but if it does dislocate, then I don't have to do an IOL exchange with a big surgery. I can just bring the lens up and suture it to the iris and I'm done. Thank you. You're welcome. And do me a favor. If you have a patient who's com uh, complex, put a three-piece because 10 years down the line, him and I will thank you for it. Uh, if you are doing, uh, that is very uh, smart techniques you are using, but uh, there is a chance that some cells can setting off inside these uh, below in that vitreous that can go inside and then they can grow and they can shrink, that kind of, uh, uh, that can happen. Right? So that can affect the epiretinal detachment kind of things. So is that cellular portion is going inside? Is that the cellular? Cell, right. Cells are going inside. Which cells are you talking about? So many uh, cells uh, are uh, around the iris and ciliary bodies also. Those are setting off during that surgery. So many things are going inside. Yeah. And that is going to inside this uh, collagen. So it's interesting because the epiretinal membrane is really not from anterior cells. It's typically from posterior prolifer uh, proliferation. So, but the one thing that you're talking about is um, we don't actually have an evidence that these cells are going to play much of a, 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 much of a role. Um, now, we know for a fact that the, there's direct communication that has been happening simply because these lenses are dislocated. Right. So there's definitely communication. And patients who are aphakic or these you know, dislocations, probably the lens is pulling against the vitreous. The lens is pulling, you know, uh, the vitreous is pulling against the retina. So I was surprised that we only had one case of retinal detachment okay. because I would have actually expected more cases of retinal detachment. Right. Okay, thanks. Thank you. The IL is, um, is also a very good solution uh, because if I have to do vitrectomy, I prefer to do via parsplana because uh, you, you save more vitreous. And then uh, if you have also, if you're lucky, but sometimes we are not so lucky, and if you have a free piece, your IOL, you can just use that IOL just to glue it. And I think this is a, a very smart solution when uh, you have a good capsular support and when uh, do you not feel that there is some vitreous and you, you check and you have no vitreous. Yeah. Uh, in other words, the glue the IL is a very stable solution if you have a more complex cases. <laughs> so, so, so I have actually, um, uh, so that's a great one. And uh, Amar Agrawal, who popularized the glued IOL, is a good friend. And we actually wrote a book uh, by complications yeah. um, of cataract surgery. And I put the iris suture chapter in that book. Um, one of the things is what we are realizing is the glued IOLs are very good for one reason. The biggest uh, advantage of a glued IOL is the fact that there's no suture. And what we were worried about 10, 15 years down the line, there's suture erosion or degradation, and we weren't sure. But actually, um, uh, from our group, what we published was electron microscopy of the degraded suture. And what it was, it was actually a sharp edge because of the eyelet of the haptic cutting over 10 years, the suture. If you don't use the eyelet and you are a rounded edge, these stitches are actually still alive and well. So the, the biggest advantage of the glued diol is because you have the haptic right there, so the haptic is not going to degrade, and you can just put it. I'm not a huge fan. I'm not a strong believer in the glue because I don't really think that the glue is what is holding it. It's the fibrosis of the sclera around the, you know, around the haptic. 
the big issue with the scleral IOLs with the glue is the fact that you have to be exactly 100, 180 degrees. And not only that, but the tunnel has to be exactly parallel. I have had to actually remove a few scleral sutured IOL, uh, scleral glued IOLs because they were a little bit tilt and they kept giving me uh, giving iris capture. And I literally just removed one um, about four weeks ago and I replaced it with a sutured IOL. So the glued IOLs, because it just got popular, I am sure that we're going to start seeing the setbacks of the glued IOLs sometime in the next few years. But that's uh, that just like any just like any technology. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.